Hello and welcome to another episode of Toxicology, brought to you by Recovery Unplugged. Here at Toxicology, we talk all things addiction, recovery, and mental health. Tonight's guest, addiction professional, Ryan Spencer. I'm your co-host, Jason Cabello, and as always, your host and mine, Joseph Gorordo. TFW, your own voice makes you a liar. There is no Joseph Gorardo. He is busy out there saving lives. It's just me. And um, also behind the scenes, Greg is back there doing his thing. We are usually a four person staff and we are our work. For, we are suffering. The labor shortage has hit us. We are half the, the human power that we usually are. So things are going to be a little slower. We're going to just take it easy, though. We're going to relax. We're going to have a good time. This is usually where Joseph and I would have our banter. So I'm just going to babble for a little while. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. But, oh, see, behind the scenes, Greg, as busy as he is, he he still has the time to ask me how my week was. My week, Greg, thank you for asking, was extremely busy. I'm going to ask you how yours was so you could type really fast. But, no, I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, My week was pretty good. Um, I've been having, I've been having this ongoing issue with the security guard at the, the grocery store right down the street from my house, because I go in sometimes after I've been skating all day, maybe I'm a little bit, you know, a little dirty, a little sweaty. And he follows me around. Like I'm going to rob that place blind while in the meantime, I'm watching people rob that place blind. However, He follows me around all the time, and I always want to be like, if I was coming in here to rob you, you would not see me coming. That would not be, you know, I would make your job super tough. So thanks, Greg, for asking. That that's how that's the only thing that really grinded my gears this week. Um, I saw a movie. I guess we could use that for uh, for our segment. I saw a movie. (laughs) I guess we could. uh, do our, our little press radio and film segment if you want to roll that and I could I could talk about press radio and film. Yeah, so I saw a movie this weekend. <laughs> um, it was a slasher film called X. And they they it was one of the first movies I've seen in a long time that there, there was drug use in it and it glamorized it. it there, there was a lot of, there were, they were doing a little bit of the toot. It was the seventies and they were filming a, uh, an X rated movie was the premise of it. And, you know, they made it look pretty good. It was uh, definitely something that I'm not used to seeing. It seems like, you know, people are a bit more sensitive in what they try to glamorize these days. So um, I don't want to babble anymore. I'm lonely up here. So, and I know I, I could see by the viewers that we have and the people ask and they're itching for him. Uh, here he is, guys. Recovery Unplugged legend, Ryan Spencer. My man. What's up, Jack? You look like a floating head almost. If you, if you had black <laughs> wallpaper, you would look just like a floating head. There's just a just the vacuum of space in between your head and, and, <laughs> and the bottom of the screen. How you doing? I'm doing well, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for being on here. Unfortunately, um, like I said earlier, Joseph is out um, making things happen. You know, Joseph, for, for those of you who don't know, Joseph is the vice president of business development for Recovery Unplugged. Hi, Judy. Um, so he's out there doing important things, making it possible for Recovery Unplugged to save even more lives than it does already, um, which is great. And just for a shout out to Ryan Spencer and your team, we, we did have a record month at Recovery Unplugged. Yeah. We are doing, and um, it seems like it just keeps better and better, man, because I pay attention. I do these monthly goals videos for the company. Where it just you know kind of give keep the morale a little bit of high, have a couple of chuckles. So I, I I know how many how many people we get to help, and it is we are we are hitting record record numbers, and a lot of that is attributed to you, to Chris Vert, who's on the call on the on the show tonight in the in the in the comments, and your team, Ryan. So thank you, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, thank you. We have a wonderful team. and I and I know to to. 
I, I can't say enough about Ryan. Even Ashley Armstrong is in there. There we go. Wow, incredible. Thanks for chiming in, Ashley. But Ryan, even on his own time, man, me and Ryan just a couple of weeks ago, he called me. He was trying to get some guy into treatment. And, you know, he thought that we might have a connection because he was a film industry guy and we might know some of the same people. And he just and, and Ryan's point, Ryan's whole outlook on the thing wasn't like we need to get this guy into recovery unplugged exclusively he was like he might be going back to la we need to find this guy some help he needs more people to talk to so i know you're passionate about what you do and i think that that's why you're you're so good at it so if you could ryan why don't you tell the people out there in podcast land who don't know you a little bit about yourself so my name is ryan spencer i've been sober since uh, October 15th, 2015, um, you know, <clears throat> my whole life probably, you know, when I was in my teens, I kind of knew I had an alcohol problem. Um, you know, I was always the party guy in high school, uh, Frank the tank, so to speak. Uh, I didn't know when to call it quits. Um, and you know, even in college, I knew I had a problem, but, um, you know, I just, my thing was, I didn't, never wanted the party to end. You know, everybody was going home. I found a way to keep going and, uh, I yeah. didn't have, I didn't have breaks. Um, oh, Sippy, there you are. How you doing, Sippy? Um, but re the reality was, is that, uh, deep down, I just always had a problem and, um, you know, from college, I, uh, I dropped out of college and, you know, followed fish for a little bit and was, uh, you know, the band, I hope. Yes. Yes. The okay. band and kind of followed them all over the United States. Um, you know, and I landed in Colorado and throughout my twenties, I noticed that, you know, I was living in Breckridge, Colorado. I noticed, uh, you know, I went to other substances. Um, and I think in 2001, um, I got hurt skiing and kind of banged up my knee and the doctor gave me, um, Oxycontin and I developed a, a taste for painkillers and not knowing what I know now, um, you know, I liked the way they made me feel of course. And, um, I developed a pill habit. And I noticed every time, you know, I jumped from, it was always geographic location, you know, like I, I tried the geographic cure. So Breckenridge, Colorado wasn't working out. So then I moved to Charleston, South Carolina. My friends, my friends from high school, a lot of my friends live in Charleston, South Carolina now. And they, they are very successful and they actually did an intervention on me because they noticed my downward slope. Um, and they saw my behavior and it just like, Ryan, what are you doing? Like, you know, you're all over the place. You just, right. you know, I was pretty much a mess. So I decided to go back to Connecticut and, mm. and then when I was living in Connecticut, I, uh, I got my broker's license and I did well for a while. Um, but I noticed I still had that craving for, you know, painkillers, alcohol, um, now, were you and, doing any kind of recovery work on yourself at that point? Or were you just, as they no. say, a dry drunk or a, uh, an abstinent? No, just, uh, you know, I knew I had a problem. I think Christmas Day, uh, I was thinking I was like 29, 30 years old. I was living with my family, my parents, just broken. You know, they, you know, my mom and dad knew I, I had something was going on with me. And I think, um, you know, Christmas day, I kind of just let it, let told them that I need help, you know? And, um, that's when I came to Texas, uh, 12 years ago, I came to Texas with a backpack and, um, tried to get sober 12 years ago and, or 10 years ago, 2012, I, I left Connecticut and, um, you know, and I did well for a little bit. I got out of treatment. I learned about the 12 steps. This guy, uh, Chris Raymer, this guy with the eye patch, um, what he was teaching us in the big book, it made sense. I was like, wow, I'm that guy. I'm definitely, I have, 
you know, I have those problems and I keep repeating that cycle over and over and over again. Yeah. So eventually I landed in um, sober living in Austin because the treatment team was like, you can't go back to Connecticut. You need to change. You need to go into sober living. I was like, fine, I will do sober living. Um, and I did well for a little bit, but of course, you know, you take away the drugs and alcohol, my addiction manifests on other things like, yeah. you know, and, and like yeah. you said, you were doing the geographical change as you hear all the time, you, you brought yourself with you, the common denominator, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no matter where you go, you're bringing yourself with you if you're, and especially if you're not trying to do anything to try to get help, you know? Yeah. So what, what was Cause I mean, cause obviously there, there was a bit of time there before you, uh, from when you came to Texas to when you ultimately got sober, um, you know, and we, we all know what happens in that. I, I know that you had, you know, you were pretty down and out, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so, you know, of course I ended up relapsing out of sober living. Um, and that's when it really hit me. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, found a way to do drugs, in, you know, intravenously. And that's when, uh, you know, down really went downhill. And I became homeless for a couple of years. Whole new ball game. Once, once that becomes part Whole of the equation. Ball game, yes. Yes. Um, and it, uh, you know, eventually I was, you know, it came to a point where, um, I didn't really have my friends that I got sober with were staying sober and, you know, obviously the friends or the acquaintances that I met that I was using with, um, you know, it's never really good friendships. They're just, you know, you just start couch surfing and then those friends get sick of you or, you know, they lose their place and you end up just on the streets. Cause I didn't know a lot of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I don't want to be a burden on any of my sober friends. So I just went the other way. Um, not knowing how, like I didn't have health insurance. I didn't, I had too much shame and guilt to ask my family for help. Um, and I ended up just on the streets for a little bit, probably about two years I was on the streets. Um, yeah, I was the same way, man. I would rather just disappear completely and just be like a mystery and have people think like, maybe I, I was okay than to actually, you know, lose face what I thought and like ask for help and tell people that I was really struggling, even though it was apparent if anybody saw me that I was not doing okay, you know? Yeah. Um. So we, we have a good comment from Sharon King. It mm -hmm. says, I'm a recovering meth addict, eight years clean, but lately I've wanted to get high really bad. She's continuing, continuing to stay clean, but it's been really hard. So Ryan, you've, you've been sober since 2015. How do you maintain your your recovery so i truly believe well one it's god right yeah I'm turning to god and also you know share and tell me who you hang out with and i'll tell you what your future is going to look like you know and i really you know it's all who i surround myself with and that's brothers in recovery that's people that are positive in my life um i would definitely go to a meeting um talk about it and work with another alcoholic addict and that will get your right. mind off off using yeah you know so there, there was a comment from davy jones on there davy jones he was one of the first people who tried to get me to go to meetings um he he, he knew my mom and um a lot of her friends from the music industry and when I when I was beginning to show signs that I really, really, really needed some help, um, me and him started hanging out. I started working with him and, you know, he would always try to I was not ready. I was far from being ready. But he used to take he used to ask me, like we would go to work on somewhere and I'd probably disappear with his car for a little while or. I definitely disappeared with his car for a little while and, and he would never, you know, yell at me about anything. But he would always ask me on the ride home, like do you want to go to a meeting, man? Like we, you should probably go to a meeting sometime. So Davey, I appreciate you. I love you, man. Uh, <laughs> hope you're staying warm in Alaska, but yeah, that's crazy. Um, so you maintain your recovery. 
by mm -hmm. still working steps, still working with people in, in the 12 step capacity, capacity, capacity. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I truly believe that the friends that I made about <clears throat> when I got out of treatment um, in 2015, um, I surrounded myself with guys that were doing the deal that because my whole thing was I like chaotic people. Right. And I like I like the you know, I was always a jokester. And yeah. this time around, I truly believe that I suffered so long. And, you know, I really want to say that if there's enough suffering, you're going to have that psychic change to right to like i didn't want to suffer the way i suffered anymore like you know and it's like um it's i wouldn't say it's the cure but i hit such a rock bottom that i didn't want to do that ever again it was traumatic yeah. it was it was to the point where um what do i need to do to get sober and i remember uh, my therapist at the treatment center i went to is you got to pick six friends six friends that push you in the right direction right the ones that go with the meetings that one the, the ones that work out the ones that have a sponsor and that do the deal like i i surrounded myself with those people in sober living and i noticed that you know i started hanging out with them and going like i, I started going to the gym with them and just surrounding myself with those people really gravitated me to the next level um and doing yeah, and then stuff. it turned it turns you into one of those six people for the next guy coming in, yes. and that's how this whole thing works. You know, it's like perpetual motion. You you keep doing it, and then your job, no matter if you've got you know thirty days of recovery or you know five years of recovery, you're helping the next guy. You know, the next guy yeah. see that it's possible. You're you're showing somebody who has no hope that there's a little you know that there is hope because. Yeah. For me, for instance, same thing. I was so broken that I had nothing to go back to. I had, I had, you know, ran it until the wheels fell off. Absolutely had nothing. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing was to take these little baby steps and to get as far away from where I was, you know, yeah. inside, like spiritually, everything about it. Like, and it was, and it was a very slow process. I know I've shared this on here before. When I first started going to meetings and somebody wished me a slow recovery while I'm still dope sick and shit, like I wanted to fucking smack them. Like that's not mm -hmm. something you want to hear when you're when you're first coming in. Like a slow recovery. It's like, no, I want this shit now. I wanna yeah. I wanna feel better. I wanna get my life together. But us and you know, coming up on six years now, like thank God for a slow recovery. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's you know. I think really the first three months of my recovery, fortunately I did 90 days of treatment and that's where I'm very like impulsive, but it really takes a good six months to a year to fully heal, you know, from, from, uh, just the shit we went through. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. and, and my, my issue was that, um, you know, like I said before, the drugs and alcohol are away from me. What is, what am I going to compulsively think about next or obsess about, or do I need the validation of this woman? What am I going to fill my void with? And this time around, I just filled it with, with going to the gym. Nines. <laughs> well, the gym, yes. Exercise is definitely a, a huge, you know, just like how you go skating, you know, that's one of your outlets, right? Yeah. Or music is a good outlet or, uh, yes, the gym is where I work out the crazy, right? It's, uh, I have a lot of energy and, and I think it, it definitely helps me. And without it, I don't know where I'd be today, but it's definitely um, in my first year of recovery, it was really doing things that made me very uncomfortable, like sharing my story in front of 80 people at a meeting like that. Right. That to me is, or making amends. That's where you separate the, the, the men from the boys. You know what I mean? Going to go sit down with somebody and tell them how you, you know, I know I've harmed you in the following ways. I did this A, B, C to you, you know, what, what I leave out, how can I make it better? Like make it amends was that put me to that next leap me into that, you know, fourth dimension. Right. 
so I love that you're talking about making amends. Okay. So I, mm -hmm. I have a sponsee that I'm working with now who I've been working with for a little while and you know, he'll keep, he'll, he'll, he'll be doing okay for like a month or two and then he'll go back out a month or two. And then it's like, every time he comes back, he's like, listen, man, I need to rush through this. I need to make these amends but to my ex-girlfriend to this and that, like, how important do you think it is to like, give yourself some time if you're going to go through like the 12 steps like they're in order for a reason you don't just because i mean one of my favorite things would be to go into to, to treatment which i did 20 times complete i would go into treatment then i'd get out get high and then want to tell everybody you know how great i'm doing and how sorry i am for what i did to them it, it was never you know i i never took things in order uh, until the one time i did and that worked out so how important do you think that is to like you know, tr trust the process is what I'm yeah. trying to, to say. Just slow down, take suggestions. Um, uh, you know, I always like, you know, uh, my, the one sponsor I have, you know, he's always eager to, you know, we was like, we got to get through that four step. We got to do this. We got to do that. He was very eager and willing, but I just told him like, no, we're going to do it on this time. Right. Day by day, slow, slow the, now, <laughs> no. <Whoa. laughs> no, yeah, that's good, man. And yeah, Jilly, Jillian Owens is waiting for the heat. So we need we need to bring some heat on you. If, if anybody has any questions or, or funny stories for 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 Ryan or of Ryan, I would love to hear them. And let's say hi to Barry Ryman, who has a podcast Wednesdays at noon right here. Um, called Rhyme and Reason, which is they just had their third episode. Barry's killing it. Um, yeah, give give Barry a watch, man. He he's got great stuff. Praise so what? So Ryan, what have you? What do you think the most important thing that you've learned in your in your personal recovery about yourself? Like, let's take you out of out of work, out of working with other people. For Ryan Spencer, what's the most important thing that you've learned about yourself in recovery? Um, that, uh, I'm very intuitive. Um, you know, um, when I have, there's sometimes I do lack self-confidence, but when I, when I obtain that goal, it's, it was like that easy. You know, um, I really truly believe that, um, you know, I was so hard on myself for so many years. Um, that's taken a long time to really love myself. Um, and I can really truly say now that I do have love for myself and I, the void, like, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, especially as us addicts, we're very sensitive and, you know, that internal dialogue in our voice is, is constantly going. And I've learned just to step back from it and bring awareness around those voices and just to, right. you know, um, you know, just, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's that, that monkey in your brain, you know, that, that constant voice. I, I just sometimes have learned to just, I, I, I hear what's going on and I just learned to step back and just, and, let it go, you know, that, um, right. uh, give myself positive affirmations. I mean, they, they say like the average person has about 55,000 negative thoughts that go through their head a day. Well, somebody of you and me probably have a little more than that considering what we've been yeah, through. At least 57 for me. <laughs> 57,000. At least. Well, so do yeah. you, do you have a hard time accepting compliments? Like if people talk about like what a great person you are and how much you've helped them and, and want to want to shine a little bit of light on you. Do you have a hard time accepting that? Um, that's a good question. You know, so because for me, it's like, yeah. Cause for me, it's just like, they'll say it and I'll be like, yeah, wait till you find out like that. It, this is all bullshit. You know, <laughs> like yeah, I still yeah. have that thing where it's like, I lied and was so dishonest for so long that, that I, I have it like in, in engraved in my brain that like, it's all bullshit. My, I have using dreams almost every single night and almost every night, like I'll, I'll be trying to get something in, in, in my old neighborhood in Florida and I'll get something and be like, 
oh man, I'm about to, I'm about to use, I'm going to have to give away all my clean time. And then somebody would be like, you don't have any clean time. You've been lying this whole fucking time. And like, wow. e like almost every night I have these dreams. Why don't you tell me wow. what that means, Ryan? The, but you never use in those dreams, right? I have, I have, but it's, oh, really? it, it's never, it's, oh, it's never like a, it's never a euphoric dream. It's never like I'm in a good place. I'm never partying. It's always like deep despair, trying to, trying to, you know, scrounge some change to get scrounge some change together or get somebody to front me something. So it always it's always in a very dark place that I'm always happy when I wake up. Where it used yeah. to be the opposite, where I used to be out there doing scroungy shit all day, and then I'd wake up, and then I I, I would have dreams that I was in a good place. So it's like it, it's flip flop. So I'd much rather be here dreaming about a shitty life than than the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it actually is right. Nothing is worse than getting high in Florida. It, it is a nightmare. <laughs> Ashley knows. Me, me yeah. and Ashley went to the same treatment center, the, the one that I went to 19 times uh, out in Florida. So we ran some of the same streets. <laughs> Shout out to Broward County. <laughs> Old Broward. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, a, a big thing that, that happens in 12 step is you, you're in search of a spiritual awakening, right? Do you remember when when the first time you had like this spiritual awakening where you where you, you felt like good about yourself again, like you felt like you were actually doing the thing, like you were done doing the fake it till you make it thing? You know, I think um, so. Really, what happened was, you know, I, like I said, when I when I fully surrendered was when I was in Williamson County Jail. You know, I was just like I'm done with this I, I just can't do it anymore and when i walked out of williamson county jail and you know john obanowski and tony messberger were there to bring me to treatment and i think tony was there because they thought i was going to probably run off and you know, go, go what I, do what I was doing again. But I had such a smile on my face seeing them just because I, I knew what it was about. I knew I was going into treatment. And on the way up, uh, John was explaining the treatment center I was going to. And that was all men, 90 days, big book thumping. Um, you learn how to become a sponsor. I think really the first week I was at that treatment center, I just was sitting in the sun knowing that I might be going to prison for my charges, but accepting that if I do go to prison, um, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. Um, and I just accepted where I was at. So, so Jillian Owens brings up, uh, she <laughs> wants to know about your sober weekends in jail. So I know that when you started at recovery unplugged, uh, <laughs> Ashley told Ashley Armstrong told me earlier that you were still spending weekends in jail when you started working in treatment. Yes. Yes. So <clears throat> through my, uh, you know, 2014 was, uh, you know, I got arrested a bunch of times, uh, one in, you know, Travis County and then Williamson County, uh, Williamson County, for those that don't know, is a really bad County to get arrested in, uh, especially when you're on probation in Travis County. So, you know, I thought I was going to be going to prison when I was working at Recovery Unplugged for a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, even my lawyer was talking about, you know, me possibly doing two to two to five years or something like that. I don't remember, but it was it was a, not, it was a length of time to, to scare the shit out of you, you know. So um, I remember telling my boss at the time, Jeremy, that, you know, I was the case manager at Recover Unplugged and uh, telling that I might be, there's a possibility that I might be going away. So I told my, I was living in sober living and I even packed up some of my stuff because I had court that day. I went to Williamson County. This is a good story actually. I went to Williamson County with my, with my lawyer and we were, we were standing in front of the judge and it was a woman judge and she, she asked the prosecutor, what are we doing with Mr. Spencer? Believe it or not, the internet went down in Williamson County that day. So the judge was getting frustrated with the prosecutor saying, what are we doing with Mr. Spencer? 
what are his charges? And they're like, we're looking up his, we're looking up his, uh, because they wanted to really throw the book at me because I had to right. Rack, you know, from forgery and government instrument to, um, you know, heroin meth charge, you know, uh, t there's tons of charges, you know, just breaking and entering just the whole rap sheet. Um, and the judge looks at me and she goes, well, what are you doing right now, Mr. Spencer, while we're waiting for the prosecutor, you know, and I told her the truth. I said, you know, I'm in sober living. I'm working at this treatment center. I get the chance to help others. I'm a case manager. Um, and, you know, just told her my, that I just got honest with her and said, you know, I'm really nervous right now because I don't know what's going to happen. And the judge is like, oh, wow, you're, you know, how, how much, you know, what are you, I'm about, I told her I'm like about nine months sober. Um, and then she looks at the prosecutor. She's like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do deferred adjudication. And I'm going to give you two weekends in jail. And I was like, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Yeah. Man. So, and I, yeah. I think I got like 200 hours of community service. But my judge, um, my lawyer was just, he was even like, wow. You know, because they really wanted yeah. to put me, put me away for a little bit. Technical difficulties or God, we may never know. Ashley thing. Armstrong. And you know what's so funny? Like anybody who's gone to meetings for quite some time um, or just a little while, you hear these stories all the time. This is yeah. not uncommon. Like for somebody to be facing years in jail or whatever it is. And for just the judge was in a good mood that day. Um, you know, the cop just decided not to, just to let me go. Like this stuff is not uncommon. I mm -hmm. don't want to even pretend like I know how to explain it or anything like that. But it, it is like if, you, if you're facing all these problems, they, they definitely say, you know, God doing for you what you can't do your, do for yourself. Like when you're yeah. in recovery, when you're doing the right things, like it's just like this things just like you're blindly taking these steps trying to go forward. And it's like the ground is just appearing in front of it. Oh, um, I heard somebody at a I heard somebody at a meeting talk about one time, like if you're if you're driving in a storm, the, you only need to see as far as the headlights will show you. Like that's mm -hmm. all you, you as long as you're going in the right direction and you're paying attention, like these things will happen. Same thing happened to me in court in um, in Miami. I had these old charges and I went into I went into court and. It, it was like a 10 year old case and the judge is like. Where you been for where you been for 10 years? So I missed I missed court day. I, I used to go into to public supermarkets in Florida and I used to take these little boxes of wine and just freaking drink them really fast, throw them away, run out. And then I went, I, you know, I went to the well one too many times in this Publix and they were looking for me. So they busted me, um, ended up getting a paper arrest and then never showed up for court 10 years later after getting clean. Um, it popped up. I got pulled over. I had to go take care of it. They said the cop asked me, where you been for the last 10 years? And I said, well, for, you know, at that point for eight of the years, I wasn't doing anything good, but you know, I, I got my shit together and now I'm doing great. I'm working in treatment. And then the judge was like, have a wonderful day. And I'm just like, okay, what about the court costs? And he's like, have a wonderful day. And just like yeah. waved me off. And I was like, holy shit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, and I'm sure there's tons of people out there who have gone through the same thing. And, you know, these are these are important things that you share with somebody when they think that they have no hope. Because when you're first trying to get yourself into treatment or you want help, your problems seem insurmountable. There is no way you understand what I'm going through. You don't understand. You know, my, my wife took my kids. My job's going to fire me. And then you see these people, you know, like yourself at meetings when you're just like, mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. And it's just like, no, you don't understand. And you're like, I, I do understand, man. Just take it easy and trust yeah. the process, you know? Trust the process. Yeah. I tell clients this, I have to tell them that story sometimes when they have a lot of le legalities. Um, and I, I always tell them like, listen, brother, like, you know, the courts don't want to put you in jail. Like they want to see the best outcome. Jail is not therapeutic. But if you keep doing the next right thing, you know, it's the right things will fall in place for you. And it's so hard when you're first getting sober, when, you know, somebody's telling you, oh, trust in God, trust in God, trust, trust, trust the process. 
you're not hearing that when you're two seconds sober. You know what I mean? You're just right. not. It's just, but I almost say, yeah, you're like in a meeting and you're hearing that and you just kind of have a little smile because I was that person thinking just like that. I was a, I was self-willed run riot in uh, treatment. You know what I mean? Right. Always having to call yeah. and find out about my stolen car. My counselor's just like, forget about the car. It's gone. You know? <laughs> So, yeah, I, David Mora brings up a good point that recovery people are so in right now. So, so tell us about how cool recovery is, Ryan. I mean, it's the greatest, it's the greatest gift I ever gave myself and to my family. Um, I'm actually to show up for my family and have a, a pure, beautiful relationship with them. Um, you know, I, from somebody that was living you know, seven years ago in a tent to owning a house and having a job and, and having a, a, a girl, the love of my life I'm about to marry. Um, it's just blessing after blessing, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, even me and my fiance, we wake up, we do these little meditations and, and it's just a, it's just a, it's just a better way of life. So and there's your fiance right there, Ashley. Yeah. She says that you, that you, Ryan, are her greatest blessing. And you, congratulations. Uh, Ryan's getting married soon, everybody. So big congrats. Can't yes. wait to go. It's going to be great. We're going to dance. We're going to have a ball. When, when When's the big date? Have you guys set a date yet? Uh, May 20th. Yeah, we're just uh, we're going to Hawaii just to elope because uh, – and then I think my family's going to have like a little gathering in Connecticut. And I'm sure you're going to want the whole thing documented on video. I'll be happy to go along. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, cover expenses and, and we'll call it even. And also we have to give a shout out to Ashley White. Ashley White Realty in Austin, <laughs> Texas. If you're looking for a house, just give Ashley a call. She's right there. She's so good. She'll hook you up. <laughs> she tell will. Her, tell her. Tell her toxicology. Yeah, use a hashtag toxicology when when you contact her, and you'll get a, a huge discount. <laughs> Just kidding. So I, I was I was I was uh, asking some people about good stories from you, and I would love to hear about your film debut in Indiana Jones. <laughs> okay. Um... I think so. Whenever the movie Indiana Jones, I was in the last Indiana Jones. It was Indiana Jones and Kingdom of the, the Crystal Skull. The Shia LaBeouf Skull. one? Yes. Kingdom of the Crystal okay. Skull. And so I was at a bar the night before, at a Yaley bar in New Haven, Connecticut. And this girl told me that they're having tryouts for Indiana Jones. The new Spielberg films getting filmed in New Haven, Connecticut. And I was like, I love Indiana Jones. I waited. The next, so I waited up all night. I love Crystal. Night. Yeah. I waited up all night, and and the next morning, I I, I uh, walked to the uh, New Haven Coliseum and waited in, in line for hours. And all I did was stand in front of a camera and to, and to say, I'm Ryan Spencer. I gave him my date of birth, my height, my weight. And the next day... They called me and said, how would you like to be the 1952 mailman? It's a character extra position. And you get paid three fifty dollars a day for three days or something like that. And I did it. And, uh, but I'm, in the, <laughs> I'm only in the movie for like a split second. Like it's when Shallow Buffs dr driving the motorcycle and he goes, you know, and I'm like in the background just standing there with the, with the ice cream man or the guy from Sopranos, the, uh, you know, uh, I forget his name, but it was uh, some guy that I was sending with ice cream, man. I was carrying boxes. But uh, even then I had a, I had a problem um, because I remember the, the onset producers would always be like, I was on so much Adderall in other substances that I couldn't stop moving around when they're like kind of grinding yes. your teeth <laughs> yeah i was like this i was like no like sir can you stop moving sir and because you have to freeze in the frame and everybody right. has to remain still and i remember just going like this <laughs> <laughs> just, and i was because i was up for days just strung right. out on, on, on adderall and whatever else you know 
So you're you're so high energy though. It, it's I I can't tell if I think Adderall would make you just over the top or if it would level you out because I you it, know it, it I makes, I am. Yeah, it makes me very quiet um, and focused. Um, right. You know, it's definitely I become like uh, I start writing algorithms and stuff. You know, I'm just, I get you know. You know, I was yeah, on, I, think we, I was put on Ritalin in high school because I was struggling in high school with my grades. I had uh, D's and uh, you know D's and C's. Just you know, kind of like they wanted me to graduate high school, but I was struggling in math. And then I was put on Ritalin, and uh, my grades went to straight A's and B's. So man, yeah. See, I I I, I was a little bit late for that, like. Um, getting prescribed stuff, but I I know that I'm textbook ADHD because I was able to like smoke crack and then like take a nap and like yeah. eat something. Greg, can you edit that out before we we go live so my mom doesn't have to hear about that? Thank you. Oh yeah, I forgot. All right, so. Mom and mom and dad watch this. <laughs> or future employers, you know. To, I told like, my live, mom live there, to watch live there this forever. Yeah, might not be a good idea, you know. So knowing that we kind of, you know, are cut from the same cloth like that, do you think if you and I, Ryan and Jason, would have met 10 years ago in your tent that we would have had fun together or we would have ripped each other off? I think we would have had fun to the point where, you know, we probably would have, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what would happen, you know. Yeah. Uh, I just, that's I a scary yeah, you would have ripped me off. I would have done the same. Who knows? You'd still be looking for me. <laughs> but yeah. you know, so so let let let's switch gears a little bit to to some little a little bit more serious stuff. Um, because I know maybe about a year or so ago, somebody who you had introduced me to, um, he had you know succumbed to the disease ultimately. And, you know, I, I had talked to you right after that. He was a close friend of yours. You were there, um, I believe, when he passed away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, in this line of work, you know, it happens every day. You know, I, I can't I can't go on social media without seeing somebody who I knew was a, a former client or somebody who I knew that I was in treatment with who, you know, pays the ultimate price to their addiction. Right. Who doesn't make it out. So how important is it for a loved one, if, if, if you could be talking to somebody who has a loved one who's struggling out there to, to get the help that they need? What do you mean, how, like how important it is? Yeah. I mean, it's life or death. Um, you know, I mean, that client we were talking about, you know, uh, you know, first of all, I always tell families this, you know, when a client does detox only, it's pretty much a waste, waste of money. It's a waste of time because yeah. if they don't extend the chances of them staying sober after detox is slim to none. I never seen somebody do detox only and really truly make it out. Maybe there's, there's a few rare cases, but I knew that patient when he wanted, he was already dictating his treatment plan. Um, you know, and I knew, I knew, I knew he was going to go back to his love, which was alcohol. And, um, uh, right. When his wife called and we had to go down to his house and, 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 you know, she, we, we broke into his house just to, you know, you know, he was peeping through the windows all shaking like a tree. Um, it was a scary sight to see. And then him seizing out on the floor was, uh, even scarier. And I had to call Dr. Warshin and, call the ambulance. And, uh, I think I even called Greg Roselle at the one point, um, and trying to give him CPR with, and seeing him pretty much die in front of me. That's a, that's a traumatizing, that's just the reality of alcoholism. You know, it's, it's, uh, right. He didn't, he wouldn't take suggestion and he wanted to do it his way, but you know, here we are, you know, it's just, you know, talking to his mom and his, his wife, it's just, it's, uh, it's devastating. You know, he was a good guy and he had so much to offer this world, just like, you know, you know, any family that, uh, has one struggling out there, you know, luckily for my family, they never gave up on me. And 
for that, I'm truly grateful for. Like, if it wasn't for my mom and dad and sister, uh, I, I probably wouldn't even be here today. You know, they right. they never gave up on me, and I'll never forget that. You know, I'm, it's just a uh, you know. And then there's the other side. There's a lot of families that enable, and they're actually killing their sons and daughters. Like they're sending them money, Venmoing them money. You know. Mom, dad, I need money for groceries when they're when they're shooting getting money for dope, you know. So it's uh you know, you you gotta know how to set boundaries and how to set the line. You know, you've gotta draw the line in the sand and say, if you don't do A, B, and C, this is what I gotta do. I gotta Right. You, gotta, you know what I mean? So it's like they say in, in, in AA about half measures, you know, what, what, what does it say? Half measures avail us nothing. Right. It's like you could lead a horse to water, but the miracle, I always say the miracle happens the day that you ask for help and are ready to accept it. You know, yeah. you start surrounding yourself with those six people, like you talked about earlier, six people that are doing positive things in their life. Even if you're still out there, even if you're still using, even if you're not ready, but build this little support group. So then when that time comes and you really are ready to help, these people aren't going to go away. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? These people are going to be there for you when you're ready, when you're ready to accept that help. And then like that, that's when that thing happens, man, when, when somebody is just, you know, whether and everybody's bottom is different. You know, you don't have to be like yourself and me and like live in a tent or go to treatment 20 times or, you know, wait till no. you're in your forties or whatever, you know, you could, the, the day that you say like, man, th this thing is not working out the way I thought it would. I am not, I'm not, I'm not good at this. I need help. And then, you know, you don't, you don't have to run it until the wheels fall off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there, yeah. there are so many people Absolutely. that are willing to help professionally and not professionally you know you you go you go to any meeting and you raise your hand and say i need help i don't know what to do you're going to find people there that are going to listen to you that are going to help you find what you need so you know that that's really really important and that and that and i tell clients this all the time like they already did the hardest part by raising their hand telling mom or dad or calling up on the phone, calling admission saying, Hey, I need help because life isn't working out too well out here. That's the hardest right. part. Right. And then, and then it's when they get into treatment, right. They all of a sudden day five, six comes around. They got food in their bellies. They already know they're already dictating. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And it's just like, no, no, you're not. Yeah. Like, shut up please like you don't know what's best for you You just got done sticking your needle in your arm you don't know what's best for you and that's like the hardest yeah. thing with my when i see that at work is when you know the you know they're humble when they're talking to me on the phone and i'll do anything and what it what it do whatever it takes they're crying to me and they're like uh, this time i'll go to php this time i'll go to sober living and then you know it's a different song and dance when they're in the second week they're at residential and they're like, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go back to my friend's apartment because he's got another, you know, and it's just like. It's, it's so it's sad because I know so many people who are not with us anymore who always said the same thing. And it was like, listen, I know what I got to do now. Like they figured it out at this point. Yeah, like, uh, I got you this. know what? And today is actually the, the three year anniversary of my friend, Justin Enoch um yeah. passing away Remember justin. justin um yeah. his mother lisa pascarosa is a great friend of the show has been on a couple times today is a three-year anniversary of you know of him him dying you know to this disease and yeah. and it's so sad because when he was doing well what what a bright person he was you know what i mean Very everybody smart. loved him yeah. so much so smart so talented and then that disease just told him like you know what to do you know and i and i think that's the craziest thing that could go through an addict's mind is this time will be different right. this time right. will this maybe this one little hit is not going to send me off to the races or maybe this little drink yeah i can handle it and I think that's the, that's, that's where the, the disconnect goes, you know, and it's like, 
right. it's, it's so blind. Like the disease is so cunning and baffling and it's, it's, a uh, you know, it's, it's a sneaky, sneaky thing. And if you're not connected and, and you know, surrounded by surrounding yourself with the right people and you know, you're not, you're in tune with your spirituality and, and you're doing all the right things, you know, it's, it's just the craziest thing to see, man. And then, uh, and I've been that guy that I remember the, uh, when I relapsed, um, uh, in 2012, I was doing so well. I was a sober house manager. I was, sh I was sharing meetings and I remember the, the, I don't know what it was, man, but this mechanic came to work on my car and he was like, just kind of like this, you know, very like seedy guy. I didn't know. I found him on Craigslist. Uh, he was a mobile mechanic and he, and I don't know what it was, but I just started talking about, he started talking about painkillers and that's when I relapsed because he was talking, right. I wasn't, you know what I mean? I thought maybe I could get away with it this time. And I took yeah. one little rock set and it set me back off. Into yeah, the I would, same here, man. I would, I would do, I would do Kratom. I would get out of treatment and just go to the gas station and get Kratom or Kratom or whatever it is. And that would always just, it didn't get me fucked up, but it gave me that one, that just enough feeling to be like, I know what I'm missing right now. Now I know what I need. And I was on, you know, then I was off to the races. Yeah. So what about the opposite end of the spectrum? The people like you and I who didn't get it the first, second, third, 19th time. And then you see this person come into treatment for the fifth, sixth time, fifth or sixth time. Somebody who you know personally, who, you know, you might not have, you might not believe that they're going to get it. And then they do. And then you see them pick up a year and then two years and then put a life together. How, how amazing does that feel for you? I mean, that's the best part of my job. I mean, that's. Yeah. That's that's why I still work in this industry is when I get calls from families that we never gave up on their loved ones. Um, you know, it gives me chills just talking about it because there's 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 a lot of sorry, my ADD is kicked in. What's Ian asking? <laughs> <What's> he... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. He said, Ryan, in your opinion, what is the biggest roadblock to the newcomer who knows nothing about the 12 step program? And taking that person from uncertain to certain about this program working. I probably read that wrong, but yeah. What what is the biggest roadblock to con to, to convince someone that this could work for them? Uh, I would tell that person to look around at all your tech tech staff, the newcomer. Uh, you know, look ask around, and and majority of us got sober through the twelve steps. I mean, you got sober through the twelve steps, Jason, right? I did get clean through the 12 steps. Yes. You know, most, most, like I always tell clients this in, in our program is that guys ask around, ask the tech staff, how they get sober. Ask the, yeah. ask some of the therapists, how they got sober, ask around, ask the people that have some sobriety time, how they got sober and 90, probably 99% of them will tell you the 12 steps. Some kind right. of 12 and steps. You and to be fair, I do know people who have gotten recovery through through different means, whether it be yeah. psychiatry, a couple other things. So there, there is other ways out there. But the thing is that you just have to be invested in it. And I think the best thing about 12 step programs is you automatically have a group of peers right there who are ready to help you when it comes to, you know, psychiatry other things like that it, it's it's not an everyday thing you're not doing this work maybe you are i don't know i'm just i'm maybe i'm speaking out of turn here but for me personally why that worked for me is like you know i had a sponsor i had a bunch of sponsee brothers and i was able to lean on these people ask them questions um like if i was going through something personal like i'm living in a halfway house um I could only stay here for another month and I got to find a place to live. What do I do? Somebody right. had been through it before and suggested some things for me and everything worked out. I mean, there's one common theme and yeah, for Ian Jackson, you know, there's one common theme with 12 step Dharma, NACAA, it's connection, you know, and yes, isolation for us addicts is a, is a killer, you know, if I'm sitting at my house on a beautiful Saturday, 
watching Netflix all day, all by myself, not talking to anyone and do that for a couple days a week, you know, not connecting with anybody. It'll be a moment of time where Ryan Spencer can go off, go off the rails. But I constitutionally have to be thinking of others all the time because I'm a selfish, self-centered person, just like the majority of us are. So I have to resolutely turn my thoughts to help someone else. Guilty as charged, man. Same here. Yeah. It's rapid fire question time. Explosions means it's rapid fire question time. You ready, oh, Ryan? Boy. Yeah. Okay. Who was your first celebrity crush? Sandra Bullock. All right. You've been sober since 2015. How many days do you have sober? Oh, I don't know. Give Hold it a on. guess. Huh? No, no, no. Give it a guess. This is rapid. Uh, uh, 3,500. 3,500. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Living or dead? Celebrity? Any man that you could have a bromance with, who would it be? Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. That's a handsome man. All right. Joseph isn't here to defend himself here, but at the gym, who goes harder? You are our, our host, Joseph Gerardo. Oh, me, of course. Oh, by, by how much? Uh, <laughs> Is he fit to at least spot you? Yes. Joseph's okay. a good that part. All right. So knowing that you're super healthy, on your cheat day, what is the first food that you go for? Pizza. Pizza. Fucking fantastic. You won. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. You know what? This made up for <laughs> Ryan and Ashley are 0-2. They were they were they were guests on the newlywed game and they were so close, but yes. 0-2. So you just made up for it. You you won today's interview. I'm gonna give it to you. Thank you. You know, and Joseph Godoro still owes us a hundred dollar gift card from the last year we won. Did we win last year? You didn't win. However, all contestants were granted the the gift card. I, I Gabby and I, my partner Gabby and I were contestants as well, and we had still never received that hundred dollar <laughs> Uber Eats card. Yeah. So Andrew Sasson, if you're listening. Thank you. All right. So, Chris, Grace, you're Coda. He spelled Coda wrong. So, my okay. dogs. I love both my dogs, Chris Bert. Grace. All right. So, we are running out of time here, unfortunately, Ryan. I could have, we could have gone for another couple hours. Do you want to see? Can we, can we, Greg, can we go for another couple hours? No? Okay. He said no. He shook his head no, unfortunately. So do you have any closing thoughts for, for anybody out there? Yeah, that now it's official. No, on the screen. Um, for those who are, are suffering out there, um, just never give up and um, turn, turn for help. You know, go to a meeting. Uh, call me. There's my number. Um, you know, is that your personal number you're putting out there. Wow, yes, that is my dedication. Personal, that's my personal number, and I'm, uh, you know, you, you could ask my fiance. My phone never stops. I never like. I always pick up for anybody, and um, you know, there's resources out there. Uh, I went to State Fund and Treatment Center. Um, there's tons of resources out there for anybody that doesn't have insurance either. You know, like. There, it's never too late. You know, I got sober at 36 years old and, um, and it's a blessing every day I wake up and I, I have a smile on my face and it's, it's God is good. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you everybody for watching and chiming in. I, I think you might be one of our most popular guests to date on here, at, at least as far as the chats go. So thank you, Ryan. And thanks everybody for tuning in. And as we always like to close it with, there's a thousand ways in and a thousand ways out. And Joseph always finds a way out of work. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.